I'm pleased that you could join the psychology department as we celebrate one of our research specialties, the, psychology, the psychological science of inequity and inequality. Before introducing this evening's lecture, let me take a few comments about how this series came about. This annual lecture series is a result of the generosity of Professor Alan L. Edwards, who made a substantial gift to establish an endowment that ensures that this series can take place free of charge to everyone in perpetuity. Professor Edwards was affiliated with our department for half a century, from his arrival in 1944 until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer. He is credited with changing the way modern psychological research is carried out by introducing modern statistical techniques to his field. His statistics books were long-standing gold standards for all of psychological research. The Edwards family contribution to the Department of Psychology is an excellent example of what can be accomplished when we have the support of members of the community, such as each of you in this room. Especially in these tough economic times, your support is critical and appreciated. I thank and applaud many of you in the audience who have already made such contributions. Without further delay, I would now like to introduce our first speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Mickey Ray Hebel, who is a professor of psychology and management at Rice University. She received her undergraduate degree from Smith College of Massachusetts, her master's for Texas A&M, and her PhD in psychology, psychology from Dartmouth. The Hebel Lab at Rice focuses on issues related to identifying, understanding, and remediating discrimination. They blend a social interpersonal perspective with an organizational one. The research is based on a less overt, overt forms of discrimination that are more prevalent today. And their innovative applied research looks at the organizational level to make change, such as the adoption of friendly climates, the provision of behavioral scripts, the enhancement of diversity figures within an organizational setting, the framing of diversity goals, and mentoring programs. Dr. Hebel has edited two books and written over 80 research articles. Notably, she's been the recipient of no less than 18 teaching awards. But no pressure tonight, Mickey, don't worry. For her research, she has received support from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and several private agencies. Join me then in welcoming this evening, Dr. Mickey Ray Hebel. Thank you, Jane. Um, I am so happy to be here, University of Washington community. And I also want to thank a couple of people. Um, I want to thank Alan Edwards and his family. Uh, so lucky to be a faculty member who um, retires with enough money f to make an endowment. I hope that's true of many of us. <laughs> uh, but I am very serious. That takes a big person to give and allow a community to come together for free to hear scholars. The next person I want to thank is Christina Olson. Um, what a wonderful host she has been. I feel so excited to come and talk to you about my research. Together we do research that is, um, has been the focus of a lot of attention lately, and it's a very under-researched program of um, study. And I think you'll feel that when you leave today because we are two of the people who are doing actual empirical research, and there's not a ton out there. Uh, so I thank Christina, and I also thank the psychology department here at University of Washington for the people who have made my day just a fabulous, my visit a fabulous one. I also want to just let you all know, if you don't know more about the psychology department, learn about it, because it is a first class group of individuals. And I was sitting there last night at a table with four of your female scholars, and I thought, wow, we have come a long way. There are four of us here, and we are talking about research ideas. I think that some of them have kids. I don't know, because we never talked about kids. We didn't talk about baking. We, didn't ta we talked about research ideas. And it was so fabulous, so girl power, OK? <laughs> now, I think I have a talk to give. So here we go. Um, the title of my talk is Stand Up and Be Counted, A Call to LGBT Individuals and Allies. And by LGBT, I mean lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Um, this is, as I said, a very hot topic. Even if you've been following the news in the last two days, uh, 
I think yesterday or the day before, Nebraska has now folded and their same-sex marriage is allowed. So another state uh, making a, a very, very dramatic change. We also, if you looked at the news today, see something by um, Ben Carson who says being gay is a choice, okay? So here we have something, again, that's substantial in the news, and I think we're gonna, the time is ripe for the sorts of research that we're doing. We also know, as Christina may alert you to, um, there's this celebrity out there. His name is Bruce Jenner and he's going through a change, okay? So all of this is alerting us to these topics, so I hope that uh, you learn about these two under-researched um, groups of individuals, and we're taking an empirical approach. So today, tonight, what I'm gonna talk about is, first of all, the incidents. Um, how many people are we talking about when we talk about GLBT? Um, and then I'm gonna talk about discrimination, and I'm gonna talk both about formal discrimination and interpersonal discrimination. And then I will talk about how we can stand up and be counted as individuals who are LGBT, who are allies, and then some bigger entities, some entities that include organizations and some the law, okay? So in terms of incidents, um, over the last 25 years, we've seen some sweeping estimates you see people say, oh, nobody's gay, okay? Very few people are really gay. Two, there's 25% of people who are gay. And I think when we look at who is LGBT, uh, we see that the estimates are reliably in the last decade about two to 10%. And this is a really hard thing to estimate because we have shifting definitions of what it means to be trans, of what it means to be bisexual, and of what it means to be gay or lesbian. We can make this assessment, and people have done this, mostly by looking at gay or lesbian households. And what they do is they count from the census the same-sex households. Um, they look at the Gallup polls, which are conducted in every state, and they look at Facebook profiles to see what gender are people interested in. So again, this is how we get these estimates. And here is um, some of the percentages if you just look across from the different studies that have been conducted. The Williams Institute, which is um, the, um, I would say the top resource, uh, it's an organization out of UCLA that conducts research on LGBT issues, um, estimates that 3.8 identify as LGBT, okay? This seems like a decidedly small number relative to these larger numbers, but this is still a very substantial portion of our population. Now, I will also say it's substantial because we go back to these measurement is issues. What does it mean to count these individuals? What does it mean to count the households? Surely these are not, people aren't putting on Facebook their profiles of stigmatized interests, okay? So when we study LGBT, first of all, we often just lop off the B and the T. We don't know what to do with B. We don't know what to do with T. It seems like there's very few T people, and in fact, that's what Christina is gonna be talking about today. So it's very hard to do this, even if we look at just L and G, which is often just referred to as gay, and that's how I'm gonna to refer to it tonight, um, we still have a what does it mean to be gay? Is it the household partnership? Is it your identity? Is it the behavior that you engage in? Is it your attraction to other people, even if you haven't behaved? Is it the relationships you currently have or had once in college 20 years ago? Um, and what do we even do with this bi? If you had this one relationship but you're not anymore, what do we do with you? So it, there's a problem with who gets counted in this research, and I will tell you the way that researchers usually deal with this is to let individuals self-identify, okay? To let individuals self-identify. But even then it's problematic because who's self-identifying? And there's implications of coming out, and we know that uh, there are these implications and so people stay closeted. And today what I wanna talk to you about is the importance of these individuals coming out. And what I wanna say right off the bat is there are going to be cases where coming out has negative implications for individuals, okay? 
And yet I am still going to suggest that in coming out, we can as a whole move further ahead as a society, okay? So why come out? Why stand up and be counted if we might potentially face discrimination? And ironically, one of the reasons I suggest that people should come out and should stand up and be counted is to reduce discrimination. And I think this is one of my favorite um, television characters, Anderson Cooper, and in July 2012, he wrote this. It's become clear, and, and this was after people guessed, is he, isn't he? A lot of women had, a lot of heterosexual women had crushes on him and said, no, no, no. And a lot of men had crushes on him and said, yes, 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 okay? <laughs> and so this was debated, and here's what Anderson Cooper finally telling us all on in July of 2012, said, it's become clear to me that by remaining silent on certain aspects of my personal life for so long, I've given some the mistaken impression that I'm trying to hide something, something that makes me uncomfortable, ashamed, or even afraid. And this is distress distressing because it's simply not true. I've also been reminded recently that while as a society we're moving toward greater inclusion and equality for all people, the tide of history only advances when people make themselves fully visible. Okay, so let's talk about discrimination. So what does discrimination against gay individuals, and I'm going to, again, be very aware that I'm cutting off B and T for now. I will pick them up later a little bit, but it's hard as a researcher to include all these groups, and I think you'll get it when I, do, when I show you this. So let's look at this group and say, all right, what's the discrimination like that they are experiencing? Is it very overt? Um, is it legal to put up signs like this, help wanted, no gays need apply? And the answer is, it depends. So right now, there is legislation that is proposed, and it's been proposed for 20 years. It's called ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And this has been proposed in Congress for 20 years. And before those 20 years, there was a similar, similar legislation that's been proposed since 1974. And this would, if passed, prohibit hiring and employment discrimination on sexual orientation and gender identity by employers where there are 15 or more employees. In 2013, finally, this passed the Senate, 64 to 32. So this was uh, bipartisan and now it's awaiting um, a vote in the House, okay? Um, in July of uh, 2014, Obama um, passed an executive order that protects LGBT in hiring for federal contracts. So we see that there is progress being made. Now, while there's not national legislation and we're hopeful that this does get passed soon, um, what we do look at is the state levels, and we see there is a state ban against discrimination in D.C., in Puerto Rico, and in 22 states. And this is hard to keep up with because it's changing. It is changing. We are in an exciting tide. There are 10 additional states that have an executive order that protect individuals in the public sector on the basis of sexual orientation. And even for states that don't have state legislation, there are city ordinances and organizational policies. So a lot of times our organizations, and I'm an organizational researcher, our organizations are leading the way, okay? They're small laboratories for what may happen in our larger communities and in our state and in our nation. Here is kind of a, a dis, if, you're, if you don't like to look at the sort of display of names, of, of, of lists, here's kind of a visual where you see the most tolerant, Rhode Island, the state level of acceptance. And again, this is from surveys. It was printed in the New York Times. And we see the least tolerant is Mississippi. We see that the southern, southern states are trailing in terms of acceptability. So we can ask, is discrimination a thing of the past if we see a lot of this is actually pretty lightly colored. Um, and we see these state laws, and we see ENDA getting farther than it's ever gotten before. We can say, is there still discrimination? And with the recent successes, it's not clear. So we see these passages of state laws. We see increases in workforce diversity. We see reductions of EEOC claims, the most egregious types. 
Uh, we see decreases shown on surveys, at least in attitudinal uh, um, measures. So when people ask, how do you feel about these groups, people say, very positively, very positively. And we see this proliferation of additional policies. So organizations will pass policies for same-sex benefits, for very inclusive policies, and have zero tolerance against discrimination. Well, we wanted to examine this behavior further by going out into the field and studying discrimination against gay individuals. And I'm going to tell you about a study that was done a while ago. This is 2002, but it is a study that I've repeated and I've used the methodology over and over again as recently as this year. So I'm going to tell you in detail about this because it will set the stage for what we found and show you the types of methodology that I use. I refer to this as the Gay and Proud Study. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to examine if and how discrimination is manifested for gay and lesbian job applicants, okay? And we conceptualized discrimination in two different ways. Formal discrimination, which is the discrimination that you think about that the laws protect, this overt discrimination, access to hiring resources, um, things that are illegal, versus this interpersonal discrimination, this idea of subtle discrimination. Some people call it incivilities. Some people call it microtransgressions. I'm not trying to corner the market with this name. It's just what our lab called it, but I see those things as the same sorts of things. It's not always illegal. It's interpersonal in nature. What I tell people is think about somebody you don't like, okay? You got that person? Got some extras. Okay, and now that person comes toward you. They're walking directly toward you. And what happens to your face? And what happens to your body? Okay, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about interpersonal discrimination. So it's expressions of reduced helping behavior, reduced friendliness, increased hostility, rudeness, interactions are shorter, you try to get by them, okay, and other nonverbal behaviors. So in this study, what we did is we sent uh, eight male and eight female job applicants who were manipulated to be obviously gay or assumed heterosexual, and they entered 84 places of employment seeking jobs. Uh, they wore jeans, a jacket with pockets, and a hat. And this is what the hat said. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this was done in Texas, so this is not the stigmatized condition, okay? <laughs> This is actually like neutral, okay, to somewhat positive. So this was what they wore in one condition, and in the other condition, they wore a hat that said gay and proud. Okay, just a little bit more about the measures. What they did is they always got a new hat after they entered the store. They came back and got a new hat. They did not know what their hat said. So they are blind to the condition that they're in. They also had tape recorders, and they put these tape recorders in their pocket, and once they entered the store, they turned on the tape recorder. You just scared me. You flashed that one-minute sign, and I thought, holy moly. <laughs> okay. They went into the store, and they asked, can I speak to somebody who has a hiring capacity? I should also tell you, we called ahead, and all of these stores had jobs. We only entered stores where they were hiring. So then they asked, can I speak to somebody who has, who's a manager or who has hiring capabilities? And they asked four standardized questions. Do you have any job openings? Can I fill out an application anyway? Um, if I were to get a job here, what would I do? And can I use your bathroom? The applicants then completed applications. In um, 2002, they still did the paper applications. They put me down as a reference, okay? And they were told, in these retail stores, there's a lot of mirrors around. Don't look at the mirrors. If you happen to see what hat you have on, let us know. We will discard that condition. We really want people to be blind. We want to know what the treatment is like. So after each store, they come out and they fill out a survey that has seven items. How friendly, how hostile, how rude, how long was the interaction, what was the eye contact, how much smiling, and a seventh I can't remember. And they guess what hat they have on. Then we also take those audio tapes and we ask people who have no idea there's a gay and proud or a Texan and proud and we just say, code these audio tapes and tell us also how much positivity on these interpersonal measures there are, okay? 
I should also say they also coded the applicant to make sure that the applicant didn't say, okay, I'm coming in, I'm talking to you, I perceive that this is not going well, I must have the gay and proud hat on, I am therefore gonna cut off interactions with you. So we wanted to, again, make sure that this was not being driven by the applicants themselves. So we looked at formal discrimination. This was whether or not they were told a job was available, their permission to complete an application, the job callbacks, which we looked at over a three month period of time, who was actually given a job and how many, and then their permission to use a bathroom, which was in a place where it's a public uh, facility. So by law, they have to allow people to use it. Um, there were no significant results on the formal measures. There were no significant differences. On interpersonal discrimination, this is the length of interactions, we saw incredible differences, okay? The interaction was much longer with the Texan and proud, shorter with the gay and proud, fewer words spoken with the gay and proud, more perceived negativity from the applicants, and more coded negativity that was not coming from the applicants themselves. So we see this very strong interpersonal discrimination. Um, this mirrors attitudinal research on a lot of uh, groups. So people will say, oh yeah, you know what, I'm really favorable toward blacks. And then there's some negativity, okay? We found it in two other LGB population, in two other samples doing the exact same thing. I'm gonna tell you about a, a, a third, a four, what will be a fourth one. And I will tell you we found it with other groups. So we found it the same lack of formal discrimination, but presence of interpersonal discrimination with people, I'm so sorry, this should say obesity prosthetic, although people might think pregnancy, but that's very different, so this should say obesity. Okay, so we again see this interpersonal discrimination. This is Whitney with an obesity prosthetic and without it. And we see it with people wearing a hijab. And we also see it with people wearing pregnancy prosthetics. So again, this real, if we're just looking at these formal measures, there's no difference. But if we look at interpersonal and dig a little deeper, what we see is that there's interpersonal discrimination. Now, you might say, well, this is a good thing. Look how far we've come. There's no formal discrimination. People can get the job. And what our research has shown is actually, our research and research that's been done by other folks and meta-analyses is that actually it's more problematic. It is more problematic to get interpersonal discrimination. When I say more problematic, it's been related to more negative health outcomes. It's been um, shown to decrease job performance more in workplaces. And on the meta-analysis, um, there's both physical, psychological, and other outcomes that are workplace-related, too, that they show differences in. Let me explain to you just for a second why this is, might be the case, because you might say, well, why, how can that be the case? It can be the case because if I am gay and I know that you have formally discriminated against me, I say, what can I do? I mean, this is about you, okay? So this is about your discriminatory behavior. It's outside of me. However, if it's interpersonal and you look at me the wrong way and you're mean to me the wrong way, what I do is I have to question that. I have to engage in thought, in, in cognitive work. I have to say, is that person mean? Is that person, does that person not like me? Is it because I'm gay? Is this like a reaction to my sexual orientation? And so it's more befuddling people, and we've shown evidence that it is, it increases the cognitive effort that you're going to, okay? And it increases, when people um, don't have this interpersonal discrimination, there's no sort of thought suppression. There's no sort of need for people to say, okay, you know, what's going on? What, how do I attribute this information? So that seems to be really problematic in people's um, behaviors. All right, so now that we've discovered there's this interpersonal discrimination, what can we do? And we're gonna get to the part about standing up and being counted, so let me tell you what we first looked at, is we went back to the Gay and Proud study, and we said, okay, so now that these individuals are experiencing this interpersonal discrimination, what can we have them do as strategies? So we sent them back in for more jobs, and they were wearing their hat, and they didn't know what hat they had on. Again, we have a Texas hat and a, um, uh, a gay and proud hat. And they do one of three things. They either acknowledge, which is uh, openly addressing their, their hat. So they say, 
um, this is a really important part of who I am. Now again, they don't know what hat they have on, okay? <laughs> They're positive, so they increase their positivity. They say, you know, I'm really excited, it's a really nice day out, and I'm just very happy about this job. Okay, so again, showing just this increase of sociability. And the third is individuation. And it's providing information that reduces the use of stereotypes. So in that condition, they say, you know, I'd love to work. I just can't, the only thing I can't do is I can't work on a part of Wednesdays because I take my mother, my grandmother to dialysis. Okay? So again, making us think that, wow, this person is something other than just Texan and proud or gay and proud. They have a grandmother who needs dialysis. Okay? So what we found, first of all, if you're a researcher, you get really excited when you find a replication. We found a replication. Um, as I tell people, I do research where good results are bad and bad results are good, okay? So we found again that those who are, were wearing the gay and proud hats received more interpersonal discrimination. But more importantly, do any of the strategies reduce interpersonal discrimination? And what we found was acknowledgement seemed to be the most beneficial and positivity was also successful. We see some evidence for individuation, but not as consistent. So we have this acknowledgement. We have people saying, this is a really important part of who I am. Now, we've done a series of other studies looking at acknowledgement, looking at people who come out in the workplace, who see supportive organizational policies and feel like they're more likely to come out, who talk about it. And you might think, why should people come out if they face uh, this discrimination? And we argue it benefits a lot of people. So we think it benefits the self, especially if this is central to you. So there are some people who say, you know, I, I don't feel like I need to come out. That's something I don't want to do. So it, to the extent that it's central, it's even more important. We think it gives people relief. There's research that shows that when people keep secrets, it's really difficult to manage information. There's identity disconnects. If you come out to some people and you don't come out to others, it's something you have to say, okay, well, now I'm in a conversation with A and B. Do they, does A know and B doesn't? And it's very, there's a lot of cognitive energy that goes into it. So we say there's, le there's no depletion. And what we also find with acknowledgments is they help what um, Davis in 1959 acknowledged was breaking through interactions. So if I tell you right up front, if you're a perceiver and you perceive that I'm gay and you're thinking, I know that person's gay or is that person gay or that person might be gay, if I bring it up, what we know is there's more attention focused on it immediately, but it actually fizzles out, okay? That's great. We've actually done an eye tracker study where we look at the attention people place on a stigmatized feature on the face and what happens when we acknowledge, and I think it's the same sort of thing that happens with LGBT folks, which is if you don't acknowledge, people are looking at that stigma, that scar, and they're looking at it, and we've tracked their eyes, and then they look away, and then they look and they look away. And I think what they're thinking is, I really want to look at that. How did that get there? Oh, I can't be looking at that. They're looking at me. Oh. I, and I think that's what's happening in our brains, too, is we're thinking, is that person a boy or a girl or what? You know, and we're so confused that sometimes the acknowledgement just disavows. It's the disavowal of deviance. Bring it up. We're going to focus on it. This is a new stimuli. And then we're going to decrease and get back to normal business. We also know that it benefits others. So the social support that it gives is incredible. Okay? It builds communities. It builds bridges to know that you're not alone, um, to show that you're a role model, that you are somebody who has achieved, and to mobilize forces and allow for the mobilization of forces. We also know that acknowledgments are more likely when there is this benefit, uh, this beneficial relationship that other people are showing you. So I did a study both on 114 transgender employees in the workplace and 220 gay men and 159 lesbians in the workplace. And what, these research, what the findings showed was that people were willing to acknowledge and when they acknowledge, that first of all, they were willing to acknowledge if organizational, they were more likely to acknowledge if organizational policies were in place. And when they acknowledged, that led to coworker support, and it was the coworker support, that initial coworker support, that led to more acknowledgments, 
increased job satisfaction, organizational in increased organizational commitment, and decreased job anxiety. We also know that acknowledgments benefit the organizations. So it prevents organizations from saying, we don't need policies because we don't have any of them. Those, those, those people don't exist, okay? And what it does is it builds stronger communities and reduces the turnover in organizations. It also um, increases the extent to which policies are passed, organizational policies that protect and promote. And finally, I argue that it, it reduces universally. It reduces stigma, and I'll show you some data on that too. But we think it changes social norms by regarding individuals favorably. Um, showing self-respect and changes in the culture. And let me just show you again, uh, July 2012 seemed to be a good time for quotes. Okay, so here's Entertainment Weekly. And we say by, we see them right, by daring anyone to overreact, the newest generation of gay public figures is making a clear statement that there's a new normal. And it consists of being plain spoken, clear and truthful about who you are. And they're referring to these celebrities who just out and say it's a different world than it was for Ellen DeGeneres. They say, this is who I am. This is who I am. Appreciate it. Get beyond it. Okay. So, again, um, if you are LGBT, I wholeheartedly believe you should stand up and be counted. Now, what about allies? Allies can stand up and be counted too. And we've done a couple of studies. I'm mostly talking today about my own research, but there's a ton of research that Leslie Ashburnardo does and some other research that's out there that talks about just how important uh, allies can be uh, when it comes to LGBT rights. What we know from this research is that allies can express dissatisfaction with prejudice behavior directly toward the perpetrator. So they can say, they can question things and say, what did you say again? What did you mean by that? I disagree with that. Okay. We know from research that it's more effective when it comes from a non-target. So they're seen as not having a stake in the matter. And when it's not direct, so I don't like it that you said that, okay? And it's not aggressive. So we're more like, well, I feel very differently about that, so put it on yourself. I feel differently. I actually don't agree with that. I have a very different experience. I know you may feel that way, but I don't, okay? And what we see is when we engage in this sort of uh, confrontation, the perpetrators um, perceive it as less of an overreaction when it's less direct. They feel less guilty, and they're more likely to change their immediate behavior. We also did a study where we went out into the field and we modeled uh, positive or negative attitudes toward gays. And what we did here is, um, it's kind of a complicated design, so essentially I am an experimenter. I say to a person walking by, I'd like you to take part in a survey. Would you like to take part in the survey? Yes, of course you would. So you're in my survey. And then I say, you know what? Oh, here comes another person. Let's get them to take part in the survey, too. Would you like to take part in the survey? And this second person coming is a confederate. That's not a person from Texas. That's a, a fake person in my study, OK? So I say, oh, look at you two. You're here, and I'm doing a study on attitudes. And what I'd like to know is your attitudes about various groups. And one of the groups is gays and lesbians. And so I say, you know what? Why don't you, my confederate, answer first? And I say, how do you feel about uh, gays and lesbians, do you feel like they're trying to get too many rights? Do you feel like they're being too vocal? And in some cases, they're uh, very neutral. In other cases, they condemn uh, uh, le gays and lesbians. And in other, time, in other cases, they support. And then we ask our subject, our naive subject, okay, now how do you feel? And what we see is that their opinion mimics the opinion over here. Okay, so we see that they are influencing, these allies are influencing these naive subjects. Now, we want to know, well, is that just because they're feeling social pressure? So we say, ah, two weeks later, guess what we did? We lost your data, but we have your email. So could we ask you again? 
and we ask it in the same questions and we use different questions. And what we find again is that condone versus condemn discrimination has an influence two weeks later. So modeling, modeling acceptance really increases other people's attitudes, okay? So allies, you have a role. Finally, I wanna talk about the role of organizations and laws. Um, my, colleague, uh, my colleagues Eden King and Jose Cortina wrote a wonderful piece about this, about why organizations should care about LGBT issues, why they should pass policies, why this should be something of importance. And it really has to do with corporate social responsibility. So their quote is, organizations have social and economic interests in building policies that support LGBT workers. Because organizations share responsibility for the social good of the communities in which they operate. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at an organizational, um, so, so let me also say, there are, this is where my research in the last um, probably five years has focused. What can organizations do? What are the policies they can do? And I'm just gonna tell you a very brief study that we did because I wanna move on to laws too. But let me say that organizations can do a lot. And I mentioned this before, but they are laboratories for how things can work out. And for LGBT, many organizations have been um, ahead of times ahead of the times, ahead of the laws. And there are some organizations that are very behind the laws, okay? But what we wanted to do was we wanted to look at how organizations could impact individuals with diversity training. And many of you may say diversity training, oh, that's a good thing. And many of you may say diversity training, that is something that is like kumbaya, feel good. And a lot of that is because it's not based on, a lot of diversity training is not based on empirical research. So we wanted to do something that was like a diversity training segment that was focused on LGBT folks. Well, I, again, I'll just say it was just focused on gays. And what we wanted to do was see if it mattered in an organization. So we got access to all the incoming freshmen at Rice University. And we got their attitudes and uh, their pre-existing behaviors toward, and we looked in this study at both uh, uh, gay and lesbians as well as black individuals. And what we asked them is, you know, how often do you interact with gays and lesbians? Um, what are your attitudes? And we had these pre-existing beliefs. And then what we did is we had them come to O Week, Orientation Week, and in this, uh, uh, session, what we did is we did a two by two. We said, okay, first of all, we want you to do some goal setting. We want you to set goals and tell us about things that you think you could engage in over your time at Rice that you think would be beneficial to gays and lesbians or blacks. Now, the other thing that happened is they have what are called O Week Advisors. So these are people who advise them in their little groups of five to seven people. And we also put them through the same thing. We said, okay, now we want you to think about how you could pass this on to those that you advise. What we wanted to mimic is in diversity training, a lot of times people go to that one hour of diversity training and then they go back to their organization and there's no managerial support the managers don't even know what was going on in the diversity training. So here we have managers that are and are not being trained with those individuals who are and are not being uh, told to set goals. Essentially what we found is we did a uh, four month follow up and an eight month follow up. And what we found, we, and by follow up I mean we looked at the attitudes and behaviors. And we found that the behaviors increased at time one, and the attitudes increased at time two. So they were actually doing the goals that they had set, and doing those goals had actually led to attitude change. It's, I, I, it's one of the most impressive studies I've done. It didn't make it in a good journal, it made it in a B journal, but I was so amazed. Okay. 
So here comes our last one, and that's do laws reduce discrimination? And this was a field study. I had a graduate student who said, I really like those hats. Let's put them back on, and let's go up to the Dallas area. This is a study that was conducted in a metropolitan area in which cities have laws, while neighboring cities just a few miles away do not. So this is pretty interesting. If, the, if you're in the Dallas area, there's Mesquite and Arlington and Fort Worth, and some of these same metropolitan areas have protective laws um, banning discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and others uh, do not. And we wanted to see, do those laws make a difference? If we go back and we look at interpersonal discrimination, are those laws showing decreases in interpersonal discrimination? So can the laws create another point at which people can stand up and be counted? This is a two openly gay versus our Texan and proud uh, Within the city law versus no law within applicant design, we go back into 240 retail stores, we repeat the same methodology, and what we find is interpersonal discrimination against applicants, but only when there are no laws. Okay? And here again is our manipulation. Here again are the cities. Okay? So we can see that we're controlling for things. Now, you might ask, well, that's correlational, as a lot of people would. Maybe it has to do with the people who moved there. We controlled for a lot of different variables. Um, I could tell you some of the things. They're kind of funny. We controlled for the number of people who voted for Mike Huckabee in one of the elections. We controlled for other factors, but we still needed this laboratory follow-up for proof. So we brought them. We brought. Um, participants into the laboratory just to show the experimental aspect of this. And what we told individuals is you're going to be trained and you're going to be trained on interviewing and you're going to interview this candidate and here's the laws that happen in, uh, that govern this uh, city of Houston. And we either told them that the laws protected people on the basis of sexual orientation or they did not protect individuals. And then they have a candidate who comes in, and on their backpack, they have a pin that says gay and proud, and they have a resume, and the resume says uh, uh, leader of the LGBT community, or they have none of those. Okay, so in this case, our confederate is the job applicant, and our participant that we're interested in is the interviewer. And what we find, again, is when they are given the, the uh, instructions that say there is no discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, they do not show the interpersonal discrimination. It's much more reduced. So, in conclusion, I hope that you've digested this, and if you haven't, here's your opportunity to wake up and get the whole, the whole gist of my talk in one slide, and that is that the incidence of LGBT is, is considerable. There are some laws, but they're not universal, and we hope that ENDA gets passed. You can all support ENDA. Um, discrimination still exists. It's particularly interpersonal, and interpersonal, we see again and again, is more negative. It's not something to be dismissed, and I, I will again say to you, okay, so let's say you make it into the interview and somebody is acting negatively toward you. They're acting like that way that that person that you don't like is acting. That doesn't make you particularly want the job. Now you have an unfriendly climate. So again, interpersonal discrimination matters. It reduces job performance. We have evidence of that in the lab. Individuals need to stand up. Yes, there will be some individuals who experience discrimination, but for the good of the community, I really advocate that everybody do what Anderson Cooper did, what everybody did, what, what the people in Hollywood are doing, which is be proud of it. Don't allow people to knock you down for it. Allies need to stand up. We need to not laugh at the jokes. We need to say we don't agree. Simple as that. Organizations can stand up. They can stand up by protecting their individuals, by having zero tolerance uh, policies, by having other protective policies in place, by making safe spaces, uh, by having affinity groups. 
And we also know that laws make a difference. They make a difference in reducing discrimination. So I hope this uh, talk has inspired you to stand up and be counted. And I also want to give thanks to, um, these are my collaborators. And also, there are, when you do the kind of research I'm doing and you go out into the field, there are literally pages and pages of undergraduate researchers that I would have to thank. So I just thank those Rice University superstars as a whole. And I um, will leave you with another quote. Gay people are born and belong to every society in the world. They are all ages, all races, all faiths. They are doctors and teachers and farmers and bankers and soldiers and athletes. And whether we know it or whether we acknowledge it, they are our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Being gay is not a Western invention. It's a human reality. This is the place where formal discrimination is still allowed. These are some of the states. These are the states we should be targeting. And I want to end with stand up and be counted. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Wonderful. We have time for about five minutes of questions. Again, if you have questions, you need to move to the middle where the two microphones are standing right there. I uh, am just curious what you would find if you studied the attitude of law enforcement towards uh, gay and lesbian homeless youth. and if your results would show the same thing and how that would play out in terms of the implications of laws because there still seem to be a lot of problems. Okay, so I, I just want to make, before you leave, I just want to make sure that I, I get what you're thinking, which is are you thinking you would still see formal discrimination? Right. Yeah, so um, thank you. It's, it's, it's a, a very good question. I, I think there are pockets of society and there are also states, and there are places where I would feel very uncomfortable doing this research and sending my Rice students, who are the Confederates. Um, there are places where there are still formal discrimination and interpersonal discrimination, and it makes me nervous every time they go out because I am always afraid that there's going to be that one incident that is the formal incident that's a big one. I think when you're talking about youth, when you're talking about police, maybe that's a con. I don't have that data, so I don't know. I don't know that population as well, but what I can say is with my own data, clearly there are areas where you would still see formal and you would see interpersonal. Hi, I'm Hi. wondering if there are other um, effective practices in diversity and anti-bias training that you could share with us. Sure. Um, would you like to hear about them at the individual, at the ally level, at the organizational level? You can organizational. take Organizational. Okay, sure. So at the organizational level, uh, one of the things that we keep seeing as goal setting is hugely important. Just the simple, it's one of the simple organizational principles. Goal setting, if you don't know what it is, it's you set goals, but let me tell you what you have to do. You have to set self-chosen, specifiable, achievable goals. So they can't be, I want to lose weight. Okay, you have to say how much you want to lose, how you're going to do it, can you really do it? And you have to make those, and if you make those public, they're more likely to happen. So we've done not only this study, but we've done another study looking at goal setting, again, trying to reduce discrimination against various groups. There were four in the other study that we did, four different groups. And we see, again, that people setting goals ab about their behaviors are very effective. This is a very, very cheap type of manipulation that people who do diversity training could do in about five to 10 minutes. And it's empirically shown to have an, there's also the diversity, the goal setting literature is huge. It's very effective. So that's one I point to. Then there's things that I mentioned at the end of my talk that can be done, just passing organizational policies letting people know there are safe spaces, letting people know there are others, okay? Here are, here's what we support. Telling people, here's, here's our affinity group, here's the person you can contact 
making, if you're an organization, make somebody the contact person. Get to know somebody who is very out and standing out and being proud and would be willing to be designated as the contact person and make sure that person is visible or the meetings are visible and they're held in conjunction. Having the managerial, um, the upper level management be present. Not just talk the talk, but actually walk the walk and be present at some of the meetings. And you know, call attention, call attention to it. So it's um, not about being colorblind to LGBT issues. It's about saying, hey, we have this, we celebrate this. Yep. I know you said that there hasn't been much um, research with commonly erased um, sexualities like bisexual, but has there been any at all with them or, for example, pansexual or asexual that has given any sort of invitation? Okay, I'm just going to look to my colleagues in social. Now, there's, there's probably literature that is not in the social field. But in the social field, do we know any? You're going to hear from one of the, in about five minutes, you're going to hear about transsexual research. Her research and the one study that I did on transsexual employees in the workplace, I think are the only two I know in IO and in social. Now, there's probably some in the clinical populations, which makes me both sad and happy if it's doing well, if it's seen as something that's a problem, and we're looking at strategies on how to cope or change or do reparative therapy, I'm very sad. Because I was just wondering what makes bisexual and pansexual and asexual um, people harder to study. <coughs> oh, I, I think it's the identification. I think it's the identification issue. I think nobody has, okay, so let's talk about this area of research. This is very, when I first started doing this, people said, you can't do that research. First of all, it's not going to get published. Journals are not, that's not a very good issue. You must, this must be a me, we call it me-search. So instead of research is me-search, so you must have issues with this, okay? I do research on obesity, so before people meet me, they often think I'm the gay, overweight woman, okay, who must have like some hang-ups and has some political agenda. It's hard to get the populations. It's hard to get um, the journal article, the journal editors will also say, geez, you're studying a really specific type of individual if, who's gay. If you're looking at self-reports and looking at their experiences, because these are individuals who are out, and those are different from people who are not out. What does it mean to be bisexual? Again, going back to what is it? Is bisexual that person who had a college experience? Is it somebody who loves and is, you know, there, there's a many different definitions. And I just think there hasn't been research on lesbians and gays. There's been so little on lesbians and gays. There's been less on trying to figure out how to work within the parameters of what bisexual means and even less than that. Because I think bisexuals often just, this is what researchers do, I think, is they see bisexuals as lesbian and gay unless they don't acknowledge it, at which point they get, that gets closeted and they're counted as heterosexual. So our counting, our bean counting is not good. <laughs> we have time for one more question over here. Well, I think one of the major points that you've made throughout this talk has been about how people who are LGBT need to stand up and be counted. And I know that, especially for a lot of young people who are LGBT, they're not only in danger of those kinds of interpersonal uh, discrimination, they're also, they could be in real physical danger from coming out and standing up. Um, so do you have any ideas about how people in that situation could, could contribute? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. And um, I would hate wouldn't it be horrible if somebody came out from hearing this talk and something horrible happened to them and then I would feel like I had that on my hands? And yet, if you look back to Anderson Cooper's, I mean, I think when you're talking about, about people who are under 17, I've been looking at mostly adults, I, I don't want to answer that fully without carefully considering what that means. What I would say is it's really important for, for schools 
just as they are organizations too, to take charge and to understand that there is a vibrant gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community in each and every one of them that often remains hidden. And we need to do more as a society to, again, make that something where there is, no, where there is zero tolerance, where, there is, um, where there's evidence that people can get support, where it is something that is appreciated, where it's not something that people, w where there's consequences for any bullying. But I don't think, I think again, uh, so we're starting to see these celebrities, we're starting to see people, you know, redefine the stigma as something that they're proud of. That should be happening in schools too. And I think that the, the younger population can probably learn from what's going on with the older population too. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. You're welcome. Thank you very much.